Tao. It's time to get educated on your Second Amendment rights. Welcome to two full hours of Gun Owners Radio. Your hosts, Dave Stahl, Joe Germisi, and Michael Schwartz will teach you about firearms, self-defense, and the laws that affect your rights to keep and bear arms. Visit GunOwnersRadio.com with questions to learn how to become a sponsor of Gun Owners Radio and get involved. Together, we will win. Now here's your hosts, Dave Stahl, Joe Germisi, and Michael Schwartz on The Answer San Diego. All right, folks. Hey, welcome to Gun Owners Radio, FM 96.1, AM 1170. The answer. Nope, that's not Michael Schwartz. Michael Schwartz is out of town. <laughs> but we are so proud to have John Dillon and the Dillon Law Group as a show sponsor. And did you know Dillon Law is one of the attorneys on the Miller versus Bonita case? And if you have legal matters that involve firearms that you need to call an attorney, then John Dillon's the one for you. Red flag laws, gun registration, gun transportation, or maybe you need to know that your guns are California compliant. Call our trusted firearms attorney, John Dillon. John Dillon specializes in a California gun law. Call him at 760-642-7150, or you can visit the website at dillonlawgp.com. Oh, and tune into the YouTube live stream at youtube.com slash gun owners radio. You can help spread the word and hit the like and subscribe button. And leave a comment as well. So, Wendy, how are you today? Doing pretty good, thanks. So you're you're driving the bus today, huh? I guess so. Yeah. Try not to crash it. All right, that's Wendy Hoffman. She is the glue that keeps San Diego County gun owners together. And you brought in a slew of folks. I did. Um, so we've got Melissa Lee here. Do you, Melissa, do you want to introduce our other two guests? Yes, so today I brought in <laughs> Smashley. Smashley is, or Ashley, she is um, a law enforcement here in San Diego, and she is a pro MMA fighter. So don't mess with her, Dave. Cool. She can get you. Not and this is Haley. She's also law enforcement. And these ladies are doing the gear review with me today. And actually, it's a little bit different today because we don't have gear to review. That would be fun. We have a class to review. So gotcha. All it's going right. to be fun. Good deal. And then, of course, we have Mr. Jamisi. Of course you do. How are so. you doing today, bud? I'm doing well. I'm doing are well. You, are, you do, are you doing a blog today? I am. Are so, you doing a gear review? Uh, no, I'm not. Okay. So, that's, uh, so it's no Melissa's gear. Melissa's week. Huh? It's Melissa's week, so, ah. so she can do the gear review. Right. Be like, sort of when we talk about guns in here. So it's, it's not really a gear. You don't really have it, but you'll talk about it. That's right. right. Yeah. So, so some <laughs> of the things we're going to talk about is a 9 millimeter ban. That's Joe Biden's recent, uh, you know, comment. The Second Amendment, uh, the fact that the Second Amendment is racist. Yeah, go figure. And the summer picnic. So it's going to be a full show. Yeah, San Diego County Gun Owners mm -hmm. has our summer picnic coming up uh, in a couple of weeks. Here, it's on Wednesday, August eighteenth, at six p.m. at Mike's Barbecue. Not Mike Shorts. Mike Schwartz's is barbecue, <laughs> but it's a, a barbecue restaurant called Mike's Barbecue right. in Escondido. Yeah, and it, a couple of easy way to get to just Google it. The food there is absolutely phenomenal. I've heard. If you haven't I'm eaten excited. there, good, good barbecue. Yeah, and we're gonna have some fun prizes and a couple of announcements, mm -hmm. and it's always a good time. It's kind of a fan appreciation barbecue, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we like to invite out. All of our members and their guests and light appetizers are on us. Uh, they've got a full menu, so check out their food as well. Mm -hmm. And it's a it's a great chance to meet a lot of the members, especially if, if you go to a particular meeting, like our central meeting or North County or South Bay, it's a really nice place to see all the people that you don't normally get to see. And believe it or not, if you're into animals, they have bones for dogs. You just give them a buck. Aww. And they'll give you a bag of bones. And I got I got some for my wife because you know, she's into dogs. <laughs> Look at all the meat on these bones. You know, we could scrape that off and have dinner. <laughs> so they'll be really, really good. All right. So with that being said, we still got five more minutes. What else do you want to talk about? Well, we've also got our Second Amendment celebration dinner coming up. That's right. It's coming right around yeah. the corner. A.K.A. Gun Prom. Uh-huh. How are we doing on ticket sales? Are we still got more? We are. It's pretty full, but we still have room. Um, so we're looking at over 800 
and 50 people right now. I think we're probably closer to 900. Oh, my gosh. So October 16th. Any Doors table, open. any table uh, sponsorships still available? Yes, they are. Because you got the regular and then the champagne. Yes, so we have a regular basic table, we have a wine table, and then That's a champagne right. table. Right, and each table gets you more and more. It does. Benefits. Yes, and the champagne table is super nice because it actually comes with a ton of raffle tickets for mm. our really, really great. Um, raffle program and then we've got a really great silent auction lined up a live auction lined up um, and it's a really fun opportunity to get really dressed up and mingle yeah. with yeah. And most the- everybody wears cowboy I don't know what that's all about but a lot of people wear cowboy Maybe hats that's just you I'm not no. sure about that or and, and Joe's Joe. over here. Th- no. Joe does a lot of cowboys. In There's town. a lot of cowboys <laughs> in this town. So, what does a basic table run? And I think it holds how many people? A basic table holds ten, and it's nine hundred and ninety dollars. Or you can wine. do individual tickets for ninety nine each. Wine table is fourteen hundred, mm-hmm. and that seats eight. And then our champagne table is three thousand, and that also seats eight. Perfect. But that, like I said, it comes with a ton of raffle tickets. I think like. Correct me if I'm wrong. It's three thousand dollars worth of raffle tickets. Wow. So, um, so it's a really great deal. And th- this is all of our early bird pricing. We decided mm-hmm. to keep the early bird pricing yeah, until that was cool. ticket sales close. And and the purpose of doing this is it's a fundraiser to help promote and keep uh, uh, San Diego County gun owners on the road to success. You know, supporting uh, not me SD. Mm-hmm. Uh, all the website, the second, you know, getting a CCW, yes. the, the, the socials that you guys have just about every day of the week, it seems like. <laughs> it feels like it. Doesn't it, though? Um, it does. But more importantly, also, it helps support candidates mm, that we right. endorse. And this, this coming year is an election year. So it's going to be an important year, you think? Very. Very, <laughs> yeah. The sheriff's election is, is one Crucial. we're keeping a close eye on. So. Well, I hear Gore's not going to run. Nope, he is not. Do you have any idea who is? We'll find out. Oh, it's we're going to keep, keep it a little bit of a secret. I see how you're rolling, okay? Well, and it's really, like I said, it's 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 absolutely a blast to go to if you've never been. And you don't have to be a gun enthusiast or even a gun owner to go. No, not at all. If you want to know about the industry, the true story, not what you hear in the media, but the true story, that's the place to go. And what will blow you away is that all of a sudden you'll look up and you'll say, oh, I didn't know you were into guns. <laughs> Isn't that how We've it is? had that happen a couple of times. Doctors, dentists, We've lawyers. We've had neighbors run neighbors. into each other. It's pretty funny. I know. I ran into a guy that manages East County Superstore. It's a used car lot. All of a sudden, I go, what are you doing here? Yeah. He says, I love guns. I said, oh, okay. He said, he's got a fistful of tickets. And, nice. Yeah. And the food's good there, too, I, I understand. Yeah. We're at the Town & Country. They've got a really great uh, menu. New and remodeled, I might add. Town very beautiful. Yes. They just... Completely remodeled their entire facility earlier this year. And we're going to have indoor year. and outdoor, right? Uh, it's going to be mostly indoor. Okay, because mm-hmm. I know at one time that they were going to. We were, it was just a possibility. Preparing. But, yeah, we were just preparing. But yeah, we're indoors this time. All right, that sounds good. All right, well, let's go ahead and take a quick break. And then when we come back, uh, what's this? This month's theme is medical. So stick around next. We're going to talk with doctors for responsible gun ownership. Dr. Robert Young from Doctors for Responsible Gun Ownership is here to help us answer the question, is gun violence really a public health issue? But first, self-defense and emergencies can happen to anyone, and there's no guarantee that the justice system will be on your side. Gun owners should have coverage for the legal battle after your self-defense battle. And while you protect your family and property, U.S. Law Shield is here to defend you 24-7, 365 days a year with comprehensive self-defense coverage at an affordable price. Bad guys don't take days off, and neither does our coverage. And guess what, Gun Owner Radio listeners? You can get a free T-shirt when you join. Use promo code GUNOWNERSRADIO at uslawshield.com. So our special guest is Dr. Robert Young. Are you there, sir? I am. Happy to be with you. Great to have you. So you're with Doctors for Responsible Gun Ownership. Yes. That sounds really interesting. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and the organization and um, introduce us to, to sure. what you do. Happy to do that. The Doctors for Responsible Gun Ownership was founded in 1994 
by a Southern Californian uh, surgeon named Timothy Wheeler, uh, who actually retired from it finally two or three years ago. Um, he was reacting to the uh, considerable antipathy expressed by organized medicine, first in his own uh, California Medical Society, and up to and including the AMA, pedi- the, the uh, National Pediatrics Organization, and the CDC. Um, we have quotes from all, leaders of all these things documenting uh, their hatred of guns. They're wanting to see them all banned. They're considering them uh, with no redeeming social value, uh, just uh, terribly prejudiced stuff. Um, so Dr. Wheeler, along with some other uh, uh, good researchers uh, and experts on the subject, testified before Congress uh, um, to describe all this. And the result of that was the Dickey Amendment of uh, 95 or 96, which uh, banned the CDC from using any money to advocate gun control. It's never banned doing research, Mm -hmm. which is the false uh, accusation of of the left and has always been. So that's that's why and how DRGO developed. And, And what we are is a national organization of anybody who wants to be be part of us, um, certainly largely focused on representing the great mass of physicians who disagree with their professional group's leaderships on guns. Um, And probably more physicians agree with us, I would guess, than with the profession's uh, continued enmity towards guns and advocacy of considering it a public health crisis and needing public health researchers to tell us how we can uh, uh, eliminate, quote, gun violence, unquote, which isn't a real term anyway. The the gun control lobby has has made up a lot of terms, Mm -hmm. like assault rifle, gun violence, epidemic, Things like that that actually, when you think, when you look at it, don't mean anything. Yeah, absolutely. Now, so we're in a position as physicians to evaluate a lot of this research that comes out from the uh, from uh, medical researchers, quote public health researchers, and most of it is shoddy to uh, uh, highly biased, and we we are people who are very willing to point that out. Awesome. We've done that. We do that in interviews. We do that in writing uh, on our website. I and we have written for lots of other national media, uh, spoken with them, of course. Um, we've testified in, at various legislatures. We've contributed to amicus curiae briefs for many of the major, um, all of the major uh, gun uh, cases that have come to the Supreme Court in the last 20 years. Um, and we're and we're all volunteers. Most of us are still very busy in our practices. <laughs> so that's in a in a thumbnail in a nutshell. That's who we are and what we do. I'm a I happen to be a uh, psychiatrist in Roche- the Rochester, New York area. I'm uh, been around for a while, so I've be- I am currently an associate clinical professor at the University of Rochester School of Medicine. I'm a distinguished life fellow of the American Psychiatric Association, which is for service to the profession. Um, I'm, have, I'm in an active practice with uh, a private practice a couple of days a week, and I'm a medical director for a uh, very busy substance abuse treatment facility in downtown Rochester. Uh, and I do this because uh, for two reasons. I do DRGO for two reasons. I am the I am the executive editor. So anything you see on our Facebook, which we update several times a day, um, anything you see on our website, we try to publish two articles a week, um, has come through me, and I'm responsible for for how it comes out. Um, I was drawn to this for for two reasons. Um, I was uh, a lot, some of my ancillary work 
had kind of died down, and I was thinking during the last part of my career, what can I do that could be of maybe some some national significance? Um, and obviously, you know, you can't just insert yourself into national prominence on, <laughs> on any subject you're thinking about. But mm-hmm. um, I also got, at the same time, I got interested in the gun question because I, in just reading about it, I realized I never read anything about the benefits. When you're evaluating interventions for public health, you balance risks versus benefits. Anything in medicine you're considering as an intervention, you balance risks versus benefits. And all I ever read about were the risks, and that made absolutely no sense. So I started reading about it more, and I realized, oh, yeah, there are huge benefits. In fact, they outweigh the risks and, and the negatives about civilian gun ownership. So I put those two things together, and I got to know Tim uh, Wheeler remotely. And this is a great place for me to work because we do have uh, uh, effects nationally on this imp- vital civil rights issue of our time. And I'm really proud to be able to contribute to that. So, so Dr. Young, what? Um, just a question, the... Um the advantage, I guess, to calling, uh, you know, to to attacking guns as a public health issue, because mm-hmm. it's it's certainly not a new thing. I mean, they were doing it back in the '90s at <clears throat> least. That's right. And they do a lot of that now, not only with guns, but you know, they'll throw racism out there as now a public health issue or mm-hmm. a crisis, and everything is. And you know, strategy wise, what's the advantage to that side for for doing that? Why, you know, why is that approach? Uh, Popular, well, I guess, nowadays. Well, the, the more acute you can make something sound, the more people get upset about it. The more people get upset about it, the more they want somebody to fix it. And the more they want somebody to fix it, they, they will listen to whoever sounds like an expert about the solutions. <laughs> the, the, gun, the gun control industry, that's the phrase I'm using lately, because it really is. These people um, make their livings uh, doing research, and holding seminars and conferences about how and why we need to reduce the number of guns in this country. Um, it is an industry, and they need to be. Uh, they need to sustain themselves. They do what they do. They want to keep doing it. They can only do that with money. Uh, they get plenty of money. Funding's been out there forever from the Bloomberg's and the Soros foundations and and other. Uh, left-leaning sources, but um, there's actually been no lack of research ever. Uh, in fact, there's more and more research uh, as a, um, there's more and more research, period. Uh, what the, This is an example of how they misconstrue things purposely. Research on uh, gun violence, supposedly, as, an, as a public health issue, has declined as a percentage of medical research. And I say, why would you not expect that? The field of medicine is constantly growing. What we've learned in genetics and um, pharmacology, drugs, uh, more and more are coming out. The the, The whole profession is getting wider and broader and deeper. Why would any one subject not gradually uh take up a smaller percentage of attention, even though the absolute number of papers published on, quote, gun violence by public health people has expanded. Thankfully, there are more and more uh, good studies by people like criminal ethnologists and economists uh, that really tell the truth. So well, wasn't... We, we pay attention to those, too. Well, wasn't that one of the issues with um, one of the original bad studies, I guess, about, um, you know, about gun uh, firearms related, I guess, murders and shootings and things like that, is that they don't, it doesn't behave like a virus. It's a different thing. No, so using no. a medical approach to study that gives you bad results as opposed to coming at it like Dr. Lott from a, an economist's uh, point of view or something like that. That's absolutely true. And John Lott, who I, I know and uh, very, very proud to know him, um, is one of the most important figures in gun research. And he he tells it like it is. Economists look at the numbers and they 
they are very good at evaluating uh, issues by by numbers. The other people who count are criminologists. They look at homicides with guns, without guns, um, and they look for the, the, the. These are all criminal acts. Period. These are not. Um, as you point out, these are not virally induced. So criminologists are the ones with the best handle on that. Uh, now, the biggest proportion of deaths by shooting are, of course, suicides. And uh, that's about half of all the all the suicides. So it's really a really important thing. Um, but that you have to look at uh, from a mental health perspective. There's no other way to consider it. Um, and to stop someone committing suicide is uh, is impossible at the point that they decide to do it. Well, see, and that's another a point of mis- misinformation that you see out there, too, because um, I believe they say the, the suicide rate is roughly, what, about 30,000 a year that are related to firearms. No. And, again, it has nothing to do with firearms. If we look at Japan, for instance, who's uh, right. consistently near the top of the list for um for number of suicides there, and nobody owns a gun in Japan. But, right. but yet the, good, the left, it just goes that way. Point. That's right, and that's one of the... Uh, the comparison to Japan is very important. A lot of people point out validly that you can, if you can stop someone from committing suicide with a firearm, they have a good chance of never dying by suicide. And if you don't, they have a real good chance, 90% chance of dying by that one one shot. It's a, it's quite a uh, lethal method to choose. But the trick is how to intervene with just those people that just hey, right Blackout time. Optics, accurate, affordable, guaranteed sporting optics that go the distance. Backed by customer service that goes that extra mile. Great guys, great products, and a great company that is making optics affordable. On top of quality optics that pay close attention to the customer experience, did you know that scopes from Come with mounts so you don't have to worry about finding one that fits. We are so excited to have them as an official partner of the show and ask, and ask for them at your local gun store or find them online at blackhoundoptics.com. All right, bringing back Dr. Robert Young from DRGO. Go ahead, Wendy. I'll let um, you. I'm sure. here. Welcome back. So Thank I wanted you. to start off this segment by talking about anti-gun bias in medicine. So when I was listening to the evidentiary hearing for the assault weapons ban lawsuit before Judge Benitez, there was some really interesting conversation back and forth between one of the doctors on the attorney general's side and Judge Benitez, who, um, you know, the state was trying to argue that the assault weapons you know, quote unquote, assault weapons are the problem. And so Judge Benitez is is questioning this doctor about whether or not the doctor can identify um, what kind of gun a bullet wound came from. You know, basically mm-hmm. trying to show that the mm-hmm. the assault weapon is not the problem. It's it's criminals. Well. Um, so, so that's just one example that I have. So do you have any other examples of um, anti-gun bias in medicine? Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm sure you we have. We don't have enough time. Yeah. <laughs> on, on, to that subject, though, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, ARs are the problem. Of course they're not the problem. Long rifles are, of any kind are used in uh, only less than 2% of all shootings, all, all murders, murder shootings. Um, if you want to label a problem, it's handguns, but they can't touch that now because um, in uh, Heller, the Supreme Court uh, uh, said properly that no government can ban the uh, ownership of handguns. Mm-hmm. Uh, so now they're, they're reaching for um, stuff, stuff that's irrelevant. Uh, I when I present slides, my uh, AR slide starts with a statement, um, do you hate me because I'm black? Is that it? <laughs> and that's true because it just looks. So examples of, uh, yeah, I've got a lot of examples. I brought a couple along, several along to share if you're interested. Go for um, it. 
But these are just examples. As I said, most of the stuff that comes out of the public health literature is uh, biased in some way. I'm, I happen to be a reviewer for three medical journals now, so I get to see this. Sometimes I get to keep this stuff from being published if, if they listen to me. The, a big one in 1993 by, by, were by two guys named Kellerman and Rivara. Uh, this still gets quoted. Uh, they, quote, found that keeping a gun in the home was associated with an increased, of homos, increased risk of homicide uh, by 2.7 times. So they're saying that if there's a gun in the home, you're 2.7 times more likely to, to be killed People still quote that. They, uh, some people say you're 44 times as likely to be killed. I don't know where that stuff comes from. Well, this is one of the crappiest studies ever published, and you, you can see it within the study. And this is true with most things. If you, you don't even have to know statistics to see this stuff. Anybody with a full high school education and common sense can tell. These guys picked three of the most crime-ridden urban areas to do this study in, number one. Well, there are more murders there, aren't there? They, and when they talked about homicide, they included all reasons that people are killed, not just guns. I mean, more people are beaten to death than shot to death. That was true then. It's true now. So homicide, by their definition, doesn't track with guns anyway. Uh, they made no distinction between legally owned and illegally introduced guns, mm -hmm. and beyond that, they didn't even they didn't even know who had guns because they got that information from interviews with family, friend, and neighbors after the events. They never saw the guns. They never saw them in police reports. Um, just just absolutely absurd. In this in their study, far greater risks. First of all, the 2.7 doesn't stand up at all. It just have to throw it out because of these reasons. Far greater risks that actually made more sense were associated with drug use, renting, domestic violence. Those makes more sense. So that's a, that's a perfect example of how awful this research is, but people grab it and hold on to it. Absolutely. Um, we know about the the ban. This isn't. Well, this is would be have public health applications, you know. You're talking about ARs. Well, we all know about the ban on ARs nationally between 94 and 2004. Um, what, every, what everybody doesn't know, and clearly Joe Biden doesn't know this, is that both the FBI and the Department of Justice afterwards assessed that they, it had no significant impact on, quote, gun violence, you know. Over 10 years is plenty of time for a ban to show some change uh, in the use of the banned item. But yet he does say that that worked, and that and he actually yeah. makes that a badge of honor. Well, he's uh, he, Joe Biden is mixed up on a lot of things we see. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I heard the NPR report, uh, the NPR, what, he had a town, town hall or something? Uh, sort of, kind of. Yeah, I heard that referred to as a pub one hour public service presentation on the symptoms of dementia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, just to turn it to a medical perspective. Yeah. Well, you might want to find that video and take a look at it yeah. and make sure you're sitting down. That's right. Um, and uh, let's see, well, banning stuff doesn't work anyway, but that's not purely medical. Um, there is a there is in some recent work, well in the aughts in the 2000s, uh, these people like this studied uh, changes in Connecticut and Missouri when they either introduced they went Missouri went from May issue to shell issue Connecticut went from shell issue to May issue, uh, and they saw well sure enough Connecticut showed a reduction in uh, in uh, Gun and shooting murders, or something, and the judging and looking at the same uh, issue in Missouri showed an increase. Ah, okay, well there you have it, right? Mm -hmm. No, in Missouri the increase after moving to shell issue was a 
lower rate of increase than what had been happening before. Hmm. That's better. Yes. Connecticut, the drop in uh, quote gun violence uh, was a less uh, quick drop than had been going on before when it was shell issue. So, in fact, their own work showed exactly the opposite of what they were trying to make it out to be, but they chose to only focus on pieces that in isolation make it look like it supports them. Right. It doesn't. Um, In uh, 2019, a couple of interesting things. Uh, People in California, uh, uh, a guy named Garen Wintema and a guy named Dan Webster on the East Coast, uh, published an article on California's longstanding universal background checks. Um, I was surprised and pleased to see this published because they had to come to the conclusion that prohibiting everyone with a violent misdemeanor, which is an idea that's been mooted for the Knicks and stuff to expand the number of prohibited persons. California has been doing that for years, and it did not affect any rates of firearm, firearm homicides or suicides at all. Interesting. So they, they, they came up, and this is a, a reasonably interpreted study, so even these anti-gun researchers sometimes run into a brick wall and have to admit that they see that their preferred ideas don't work. Uh, one of our DRGO uh, members, uh, a surgeon, published the same year in uh, Journal of the American College of Surgeons that And he looked nationwide at everything, everywhere, every jurisdiction. States liberalizing concealed carry saw no effects, either way, on violent crime. Now, this isn't the main argument to make. The main argument is the rights protected by the Second Amendment. But there's all sorts of data out there showing that we're better off uh, if at least not worse off, uh, by civilians owning guns and having them uh, just in case. We can talk about defensive uses of guns, uh, too, where it's just where I came into it. We uh, know about Kleck's research in the 90s. What a lot of people don't know is that his finding that there are probably 2 million or more defensive defensive uses of firearms each year. This This work was replicated in a survey by the CDC two years later, and it never published its findings. Gary Click ran across it two years ago. Very intriguing. Yes, it is. And they were still run by the same people who said, we have to get rid of guns and make them uh, hated by the American population. Yeah. They never published it because their findings confirmed Kleck's. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so we got to wrap it up, but I want to okay. give you one minute to let us know about um, how we can get involved with Doctors for Responsible Gun Ownership and yeah. um, what listeners should do to take action against anti-gun bias. Well, follow us. We, our website is drgo.us. We're on Facebook at Doctors for Responsible Gun Ownership. We welcome any members. Uh, we ask for 40 bucks as a lifetime membership fee, but if you can't afford it, join anyway. Um, people uh, are welcome to get involved to help us in a number of ways. Uh, we'll tell you how. We have a main, a big project uh, it, that's been going on for years. We're trying to match gun-respecting health care providers with patients who want that sort of provider. Mm. Too many cool. patients are bullied by their doctors. Very wow. cool. That's the best thing you could have ended the segment with, yeah. if there ever was one. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Robert Young. You've been at, That was an amazing uh, two segments, and uh, we look forward to talking to you down the road. I'd be delighted. You all take care, please. Thank you, sir. We are talking with Tim Heron, someone that has reached the pinnacle of competitive shooting and earned the title of Grand Master. But first, are you tired of your money going to big tech companies that are censoring first uh, free speech? Check out Free Speech Alternative, conservativeeconomy.com. 
slash gun owners radio. You can shop electronics, home goods, office products, and a whole lot more. And you know what you can find on conservative economy that you can't find on Amazon? Guns. When you shop at conservative economy, you also help gun owners radio. Just go to conservative economy.com slash gun owners radio. That's conservative economy.com slash gun owners radio. All right. So we've got Tim Heron on the line. Yep. Tim, are you there? I'm with you. Awesome. Hey, Tim. This is Melissa. Um, Hi, Melissa. How are you? Good. Finally, uh, it's nice to finally hear your voice. Um, thank you for joining us. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah. So Tim Heron is the owner and chief instructor of Tim Heron Shooting. Um, his website is timheronshooting.com. So, Tim, I wanted you um, to tell us, like, how did you start in competitive shooting? How did you get so good? How did you become a grandmaster? Because this is so interesting. Because I oh. do competitive shooting, and I suck. Mm-hmm. I, I, I do. I suck. Nonsense. That's why we're gonna. That's why we're gonna train together. So I nonsense. Suck. <laughs> this, no, this is this is great. I mean, everybody has to start someplace, right? Um, I, I I started shooting um, actually when I very first. I, I believe it or not, owned my very first pistol. Um, back in 2010, I, I wasn't one of these folks, uh, you know, that was kind of born and raised around guns or, you know, in a family, you know, uh, kind of you know, comprised around, uh, you know, gun ownership and things like that. Um, and in 2010, I kind of had some, some life changes and things that, that happened that, that kind of led me to, you know, I, I guess having a feeling that I needed to, uh, you know, to, to be able to protect myself and my family, um, you know, and it's for a lot of reasons that most people get into their first, you know, by their first firearm. Um, it was very soon thereafter, um, as I, I was going to the range all the time. And I'm one of those kind of people that like, when I start doing something, I'm not a, uh, you know, just kind of dip a toe in the water and Hey, this is, this is kind of neat. It like, I, I seek out instruction. I want to be the best at what I, you know, what I can do, you know, uh, given whatever the hobby or lifestyle or, you know, whatever it is. And, um, that, uh, that, that kind of started me on the, on this journey. Um, I found competitive shooting with the uh, United States practical shooting association, USPSA, um, about six to eight months into my journey as a shooter. And, man, it's <laughs> things, things just weren't the same. They were, they, they just were awesome to find a sport where, you know, you could do things like learn to draw from a pistol, you know, learn to draw a pistol from a holster fast. And, um, you know, like you're timed on things, um, and, and you have to shoot accurately and you have to shoot expediently. And it just, uh, I mean, to me, it was just one of those things that just, it really grabbed my attention and it became something I wanted to do all the time. So um, from the time that I started shooting until about 2014 is about how long it took me. So about four years to, um, to go from, you know, a, a brand kind of a, honestly, a brand new shooter to the, uh, the level of, of grandmaster. And as a grandmaster level shooter four years in, in, yeah, in about four years. So, and, and honestly, working with a lot of students, that's, yeah, that's kind of about the average amount of time that it. I mean, that somebody is that is really determined, or or kind of dedicated to. Um, uh, you know, I guess honestly, shooting is kind of like just any other kind of martial art. Uh, four to five years is about the the average time for somebody that is that is really driven to 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 succeed and improve. To to about how long it takes them to get to that point. Um, there's um about four of us here that shoot. Um, I don't know competitively, but at least two of us do. So Joe Jamisi is one of our hosts, and he actually shoots competitively too. I've shot matches awesome. with him. Um, my problem is, is mm-hmm. I'm accurate, but I am slow. That's ah, probably club, my, my <laughs> <laughs> that's my worst thing is like I am slow, but I'm very deliberate at my shooting because I figure tactically if I'm going to shoot somebody <laughs> in self-defense, I'm, I want to hit them on the first shot. I don't want to miss. I, I totally, I totally understand. And I came from kind of that same, you know, there's, there's kind of two camps there as far as shooters, right? There's, there's, there's folks that, you know, they immediately kind of pick up obviously the importance of, of accuracy and become very accurate shooters, but unfortunately don't know how to kind of put, 
uh, you know, kind of be able to put the kind of the speed foot forward on things and learn how to carry carry that accuracy into uh, being able to shoot, uh, you know, to be able to shoot faster as well. The other side of the house, right, are, are folks that kind of, you know, they, they pick up shooting or they start shooting because they watch somebody either like on a YouTube video or maybe on TV or a movie or things. And they, they see things like, you know, like John Wick movies or things. And they're like, oh, that's so easy. You know, like anybody can go fast. And, and they learn to go fast really, really quickly. And unfortunately, you know, they struggle in the accuracy department. So my job um, you know, as an instructor, of course, is to to be able to blend those two efficiencies together to to bring the most efficient and accurate shooter I possibly you know can can build somebody to be, and then also be able to apply the speed to them as well. So, um, and, and that's kind of how I started. I was a very accurate shooter, kind of more bullseye based. You know, like I wanted to shoot, you know, like the wings off of a fly. You know, <laughs> you know, so to speak. Um, but, you know, of course, I was doing it very diligently and, and very carefully. Um, and USPSA and, and competitive shooting actually kind of taught me how to how to build the speed on top of that. So, you know, uh, you know, fortunately, now I, I kind of feel like I'm, I've got the, be- the best of both worlds there. And of course, it's, it's not that just because I made you know, the, the level of, of grandmaster, it's like being a black belt, you know, in, in a traditional martial art. It doesn't mean that the journey is, is over for me, right. Or that I've achieved. It just means that like, okay, great. Now I've just got to continue to hone and work on those skills for the rest of my life, you know, to, to, can you, to, to continually improve them as well. So it's, so, it's always a, it's always an improvement. I have two law enforcement ladies in here and I kind of like to ask them in your shooting journey, what is your strength and what are your weaknesses? And Joe, the same thing with you. What would you like to improve in your shooting? You asking first. You just asked all three. Okay. Well, I'll grab it first here <laughs> okay. since I'm here. Um, cause, uh, yeah, it's just like, like Tim was saying, um, you know, starting out there, building that speed and accuracy, because that that's, you know, the approach and everybody knows this too. It's, it's, you know, you start out with the accuracy and then you get faster until you're not accurate anymore and you dial it back and you just try to progress that way. But, um, mm-hmm. that I think, uh, as Melissa was saying, I think that was my biggest struggle too, is, uh, cause I tend to shoot product. Well, I still shoot production. I'm thinking about moving over to uh, carry, carry optics, optics now, but <laughs> um, that's, that's probably the most uh, prevalent division I think right now in USPSA. I mean, just just looking at the over the last two or three years of growth in that in that particular division, I, it's become the most popular for you know for good reason too. So yeah, and I think with um, with the production stuff, I mean, working with the uh, the iron sights and everything, and practicing the fundamentals, you get up to a part. Mm-hmm. But but just like Melissa was saying, I tend to. Okay, I'm moving quickly from target to target. My split uh, times are pretty good, but I I dwell on that front sight for longer than I should. It, it goofs me up. So um, yeah. I think that would be my biggest challenge here, progressing. Oh man, that that's I, I hate to say it. That's an easy fix. Like I look at that and I I start wringing my hands, you know, in like joy. I'm like, oh man, have I got some great things that we could work on that would really like really way peel away a lot of those. A lot of this, I think formalities, right? I think a lot of shooters or a lot of folks, you know, like have these preconceived notions that you must see this visually in order to accomplish this, you know, and it's, that's not necessarily the case. So um, there, there, there's a lot of things like in my classes that I think would help, like I said, kind of peel away the layer, so to speak, to let you see just potentially how fast you can see and, uh, and and how fast you can shoot and remain accurate as well. Okay, we're going to have to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do that. All right, so Ash, what do you think you would love to learn from Tim or improve in your shooting? Um, I think my biggest weakness... P- push it over. <laughs> my biggest weakness, and as a police officer, we don't train this enough, is shooting on the move. Um, running and shooting, walking and shooting. You know, when we qualify... At least in my department, we just stand still at like different um, lengths away from the target, and it's mm-hmm. just stagnant shooting. But when it comes time to like defend my life, I mean, if I'm not behind cover, I'm going to be running to cover and fighting back. So um, I think when you're moving and shooting, you know, your your accuracy is going to change. So it's something I definitely couldn't ag- improve. I at. couldn't agree more. And that's that's where like my, my curriculum and my program. Um, 
like it really pays dividends. Um, and I do teach like private law enforcement, you know, classes as well as open enrollment classes, you know, for, for competitive shooters and hobbyists. Uh, like I said, I also, uh, also do work with different departments as well. And that's always the biggest, uh, you know, kind of foundational change in their shooting is they just don't like, I, I hate to say it, like most officers don't get any sort of training, like on, on the dynamic side of the house, right? Like how to, enter behind a wall or barricade or, you know, a, a, a structure of cover like with the gun up ready to do work sooner, right? Or what to do if you need to leave that position to something else or be able to shoot on the move or, you know, like, like I said, I think a lot of like what I love to be able to expose to police officers is the the more confident I can get you behind the gun, then the less that the problem at hand becomes about the shooting solution, you're able to apply, you know, kind of your, your brand width of, of thinking power to, to, to other problems. Right. And if I can get you to problem solve more effectively with the pistol in the hand, then you know, chances are the, the pistol doesn't become the, the always to become the solution. You know what I mean? Exactly. So um, before we go, um, I wanted to mention Tim Heron's, um, website and you can look at all his classes and sign up there actually he's actually going to be here this weekend and i think you have a few spots open don't you i do yeah i'll be at the uh, academy southwest range uh yep. there in, in southern san diego and uh i'm coming in on on friday morning and my class is on saturday and sunday and yeah i think there's four there's or a, five yeah uh, there's a five few yeah there's a few, so. few of them yeah um so if I you want to sign up everybody out um go to tim here and shooting.com or message him on instagram making a citizen's arrest is that a good idea we're gonna talk about joe's latest blog topic next but first maybe you've heard of good old mike lindell and my pillow well his company was banned because he stood against the cancel culture mob what happened to my pillow is not right our freedom of speech is just as important as our freedom of self-defense we are thrilled to support an american company like my pillow Go to MyPillow.com and use promo code FREEMARKET3 and get up to a 66% off America's best pillow. Get a great night's sleep and enjoy the satisfaction of supporting companies fighting against cancel culture. That's MyPillow.com and use promo code FREEMARKET3. All right, Joe. Okay, that's it. I jump right in here. You can just jump right in. <laughs> Both feet. So, um, yeah, this week we we're talking about making a citizen's arrest, and is that a good idea? And um, came across the subject came up this week. Um, so I was, I was thinking about, uh, you know, as we were talking about, it, I'm thinking, yeah, it's probably a good little thing to write about. So uh, that idea of making a citizen's arrest, everybody's probably heard of that, um, probably from a movie or from TV or something like that. But is it a real thing? And um, you know, and is it a good idea? So uh, it is, in fact, a real thing, which is interesting. Uh, there's statutes uh, that cover that in most of the 50 states, I think all the 50 states, uh, certainly in California. And it's actually pretty straightforward as to, um, you know, how it or what they say, basically. It's, it's three lines. And it's interesting because this has been around since in California since 1872. And I think the idea was it probably sounded like a good idea years ago when law enforcement was – you know, hours, if not days away. So maybe something like that was a, a good thing. But um, they're real specific about it. And, um, you know, some it says uh, basically a person could uh, may arrest another person uh, for a public offense uh, committed or attempted in his presence or when a person um, has committed a felony, although the person arresting doesn't need to see that, um, or when a felony has, in fact, been committed and... Um, you believe that the person you're arresting has, uh, you know, you have a reasonable um, belief that he has committed the felony. And what's interesting, you know, it sounds like a pretty straightforward thing, but um, if you think about it, you know, what could go wrong? And like a million different things can go wrong with doing that. And it's, it's really a bad idea. But if you just think about it and break it apart, you know, first off, um, there, there's a difference, I guess, between um, an infraction and a misdemeanor. And um, for the um, citizen's arrest thing, you can arrest someone uh, apparently for a misdemeanor, but not an infraction. And, you know, as a, as a citizen, do you have that training? Do you know what that is? Can you tell the difference? Because the legal jeopardy, if you do something like that or try to detain someone, um, 
and you're not warranted in doing that, the, the possibility of, of you now committing a crime, uh, of you committing assault or something like that is, is, is very good. Even aside from the, um, the legal part of it, the civil jeopardy, if you injure someone trying to do something like that, and again, you're not warranted, um, you know, there's all sorts of uh, civil jeopardy that you expose yourself to. And, uh, you know, for law enforcement, it's a different thing because law enforcement has a different mission. And because they have a different mission, they have different rules. Um, law enforcement is trained in that. They're trained in the, you know, in the laws and applying the laws. They're trained in how to, um, in how to arrest somebody or put somebody in custody or take somebody into custody. And um, if, uh, you know, as a civilian, you don't have that. Um, they've got, um, what else are I going to think about with the, uh, with this thing? Gosh, it's uh, slipping my mind here. Ah, so um, the uh, term I'm looking for, I can't believe I can't think of it. I do um, love that. No, it's, oh, qualified immunity. Gosh, that's what I'm trying to think of. Uh, something police officers have because of the job they have to do. You don't have that. Uh, police officers have backup. They have training. They have lots of things like that. As a civilian, uh, you don't have that. And um, there's the other thing, it, uh, the person you're trying to arrest, what if they don't want to be arrested? Uh, because, again, police officers have lots of other options to doing that. You as a civilian uh, really don't have those kinds of options. And uh, there really isn't, you know, especially if you think about this uh, in the terms of a, an armed civilian, say a uh, concealed carrier, um, you really don't have anything because, okay, it can escalate. You have to remember this um, as uh, something that we always talk about with concealed carry is since you're armed, there's always the possibility of things escalating up to a deadly force kind of thing because you're carrying deadly force. And uh, really trying to make some kind of citizen's arrest or trying to detain someone, especially someone that does not want to be detained, um, you don't really have many options with that. So it's, uh, it's really kind of a supremely bad idea to think about that. I mean, it might, it might sound like a good idea, you know, watching it on TV or seeing it in a movie or something like that. Uh, but in real life, it's a terrible idea to think about uh, doing a citizen's arrest. I think you're, the best thing to be is a, um, a good citizen, a good witness, a good responsible gun owner. And, um, you know, call 911. Call the police. Let the professionals deal with it. But it's interesting that, um, you know, that, that is a possibility. It is a real thing. And um, they have that statute. I don't know. Do you guys have any uh, thoughts on that? Or have you experienced any of that? Or ever seen anyone what, do what that? What is your opinion of, of a citizen doing a, uh, a citizen's arrest um so a citizen's arrest uh like you were saying i think a lot of people assume it's like i can physically put my body on this person and say you're i'm arresting you and then the police get here and all that works um that is not at all how it works and like you said there is a lot of um you know potential consequences for the person doing that um, that they might not know about on our end of it it's Basically, if at least at the misdemeanor level, I'll talk about if it did not happen in our presence, there's really nothing we can do about it. So perfect example, we get these all the time, trespassing calls. Someone's on my property. I don't want them here. Uh, while we're on our way there, obviously, we want to respond to that. But we ask our dispatchers all the time, does the reporting party want to press charges? Um, a lot of the times they'll say yes, and sometimes it's under the pressure of thinking the police won't come if I don't tell them yes. Um, because basically if they're not willing to press charges and we don't have anything that we can enforce separate from that, there's nothing we can do. Um, if someone does want to press charges, we explain how that process works, and a lot of them, you know, they'll say yes and this, and we get our paperwork, and we're facilitating the paperwork really is what it is. Um, we explain to them, you know, their side of having to go to court and all of that. And then the person gets issued that ticket and they get to leave. And a lot of the time, uh, the reporting party is very upset because they're like, why aren't they going to jail? Why aren't they going to this? And right. we told them it doesn't work that way. Yeah. So, well, what if I, what if I witness somebody beating up somebody else? Cause you see it on the news all the time. Now the people in the public just sit there and watch the guy you know, beat somebody else half to death. So if that person was to jump in and stop him without saying you're under arrest, where does that put that person that jumped into the middle of it? I think being a good citizen and just wanting to do the right thing to help somebody, um, you know, that's what's going to be taken into consideration is 
um, you know, now that you're part of it, you know, we, we have to look at the totality of the entire circumstance. So, so I'm sitting on him and he can't get up. You yeah. Know, and, he, and I'm not going to let so, him get up to yes. get there. And it's interesting you say that because if this person is now injured, the suspect, so to speak, um, because of something you did, even though it's an act of self-defense, mm-hmm. they also have that option to press charges on you. Gotcha. Um, in the event neither of you want to press charges and that's all it is, maybe a good bar fight or something, uh, we call that pretty much mutual combat. Everyone just go your separate way and that's it. Wow. Um, but you can equally be put in that same position if they so want it to. puts you in a really sticky situation if you see, I'm just going to say, a guy beating up on a girl, you know, a defenseless woman. Uh, different, a little bit different. That is goes it? into domestic violence. That uh-huh. one we take very se- separately. Right. Yes. Best <laughs> thing to do is don't come out of your house. Just stay in it the rest of your life. All right. Rogue Methods and Fieldcraft Survival are huge names in the training ecosystem, and Melissa is going to talk about a class that she just took with them. But first, primeres.com slash alpine. Are you in the military? Are you looking for help with a VA loan? Or if you're looking to buy or refi, or if you're considering a reverse mortgage, call our local mortgage guy that you can trust. Call Chris Wiley at PRMI Mortgage. For nearly 25 years, Chris has been helping local San Diegans with all their mortgage needs. You can give Chris a call at 619-722-1303 or just go to primeres.com slash alpine. All right, Melissa, it's all yours. Um, So today, um, usually I do a gear review for you guys. Um, This is going to be a little bit different because um, this is a training class. This training class was something I have never seen before, and it was... Thank you. Um, This training class I've never seen before, and it was intense. And this was a training class um, by Rogue Methods. And on the air today, we have the CEO of uh, and and head trainer for uh, Rogue Methods, um, Raul Martinez. You there? I am. How are you guys? Good. Good. So today, today, um, I have... um, Ashley or some Ashley with me and Haley who took your class. I personally did not take the class. I was the taking class. photos with you um, and these two ladies. I want them to review the class, but I have never seen so many people dig so deep to fight for a gun and not get shot with a sim. <laughs> so, so tell us, so tell us about your class. Tell us what this class is about. Uh, well, first of all, happy birthday, Ashley. I know it's tomorrow, but a happy, Hi. quick, early birthday happy to birthday. you. Um, uh, you know how I know, and it, it's friends that you have and, and me confirming via your order. So it's not <laughs> creepy. It's it's uh, being informed. <laughs> Thank you, Raul. Uh, my pleasure. Happy to hear your voice. Uh, I'm going to be seeing you soon, right? We're seeing each other for training the 21st of this month and then again in October. Yeah. Um, but uh, so the class... Uh, it's very interesting what, what we see develop. And, and there is programming that helps us really uh, control the other person in the sense of just, just enough space where we can stay there. Obviously, we're not striking, though there are portions of the full course that will have striking. But what we see is, is this, it's almost this organized chaos of I don't want to get shot and I definitely don't want to shoot them if I don't have to. So if I can gain control, that'd be great. Uh, but there is a gun in place. And a lot of this came from my law enforcement experience. And, and, and Ashley knows this, and, and so does Haley. Like, there's times where you are the person that brings the gun to the game. Uh, you just show up, and it's people that didn't have guns. So in the law enforcement capacity, and now in the uh, more heavily concealed carry groups uh, across the country, the idea that you're the one bringing the gun, you should be able to one, keep it, um, or get it back if you do lose it. And that's really what Rogue Methods is about, is to reintroduce the fight in gunfighting um, and really take away just the shooting aspect, though we do do some shooting. Um, it's to show you what you are capable of, even with the little bit of skill that you might have or just whatever with whatever you walk on uh, that day. So we had a guy playing yesterday for a class. He had never done any sort of physical fitness activities. He just concealed carries and draws really <laughs> 
Raul, so sorry to interrupt you, but guess what? We have a happy birthday giant chocolate donut for Smashly. It says happy birthday, uh, yes. Smashly, and it's a giant chocolate oh donut. God. Somebody take a picture of that. Somebody take a picture. Somebody take a picture of that, Haley. So let's sing happy birthday to her. We can do it quickly. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy, happy birthday, birthday, dear Smashly. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. And many more. <laughs> Yeah. Hey, she never been so out one hey. shot. Okay, put it here, and then we'll cut it up. Never been so happy not to have the microphone in front of me for that time. That was cool. Yeah, really. <laughs> anyway, back to the show. There you go. <laughs> he lost his train of thought. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, if you want, I, I can totally continue. I, I didn't want to interrupt. Yeah, go right ahead. Because they're, they're munching away now on his big donut. <laughs> so it's going to be a muscle conversation. Uh, so... It, the program really does lead, it, it lends to that. It lends to the, it, it could be just anybody, but we're seeing a lot more law enforcement, which uh, just in my heart, that's one of those things where they need the training. They, they have to carry this thing for work and it should be a, a capability of theirs to, to keep the gun and not have it taken away and used against them. We had a, we have a, we had a big parade in Chicago. We still do our, not necessarily a parade, but a, a, a a memorial for Thor Soderbergh, and he was one of those officers that went to a call. It was on a, C- a CTA bus, and the lady overpowered him. She's just a really heavy set woman, uh, some mental issues, uh, took his gun in a scramble, and it was the old school guys with leather holsters, right? So it's a lot easier to take those guns away. Um, and he ended up succumbing to his injuries with his own gun. And it's one of those things that, that always spoke to me in training. I've done a lot of combative training, wrestling, uh, MMA jiu-jitsu and i've been surrounded by really great guys who paint the perspective of being capable just be able to do something and i was like well how can i bring this to the masses in the sense that you don't have to have any training just show up you have some fundamental in shooting and just a safe shooter because uh, we are going to be on the range for a little bit you get to experience your gun doing certain things and then you get to fix that gun so that if you have to use it you can clear it uh, after the the problem that, that, that has come up from scrambling over a gun. There's a lot of hands and fingers going into different places. Magazines can be dropped. Uh, triggers can be pulled and gun, the gun discharges in random directions. And they're able to then experience this in a, in a controlled environment. But it's still, and I use the word violent because it, it paints a, a, a stronger picture, but it's controlled chaos. And really, you get to, to feel it. And there is an end result. If you get shot with a sim gun, you're going to feel that. It's going to leave a mark. Uh, we do have protective headgear. It's all completely rated for, for impact with ammunition, so our faces are protected, but the body is not. So you see a lot of body shots, uh, random shots in different places. Uh, people get shot in the butt. I got shot people twice. Shot in the <laughs> so, yeah. And uh, the bystanders get shot, and it really does simulate what, in, like, uh, an example would be of the class this weekend. One of the guys got bear hugged from behind, similar to a police the back sequence. And he spun the guy in a circle. And in that spin, the the guy that was holding the gun pointed the gun at everybody in the crowd. Everybody oh, like, wow. head, like, oh, no. Um, but, but things like that will happen in, in, in the world. And so if we can experience that and give you more control and give you the confidence, and really what it is, it's going to give you confidence that I've been here. Uh, I've experienced this. It feels gnarly, and I'm, I can get past this. Obviously, it's on a smaller scale. But at least you've done it, and you've held an actual gun that fires and cycles, and you have to clear the malfunction in order for it to work uh, for you the next iteration. So uh, it, it really is something special. Uh, I'm definitely not the pioneer in this game. I, I came along a little later. There are guys who've been doing this for a long time. I think I'm just bringing a fresh perspective. And I'm, I'm trying to cater to everybody. I'm not trying to isolate straight groups over others. I just want everybody to be safer so that the confidence in the American people is there again. And everybody's just better for it. So that's the goal. Hey, Raul, can I ask you a question real quickly? Is, is your approach or your methods different um, when you're training law enforcement people uh, than they would be training civilians? There's a slight variation where I explain certain things differently. Um, but the program is the same. I want everybody to be fully capable. And what's great is we're not getting a mixed batch of like potential bad guys in the mix with cops in the mix with everyday folks. It's everybody's in the, on that same path of just betterment to secure themselves and their family. So 
the training is the same across the board, but there are wording twists and there are angles that are better for law enforcement. Depending on which side the officer carries the gun, I'm going to teach them to favor the other side so that they can keep that side free during a draw. And we'll see this more in the full course. Like I'm running a bunch of seminars to really test the market and see how interested people are in a program like this. And it's, it's been received really well. And so now the full program is running out there and that's going to show officers. And when it's a law enforcement only class, um, even the name is different because we don't want necessarily to, to promote this overly aggressive sense of being as an, as an officer because they are the shield, right? So what it is, is it's just more how to control without having to fire where the person getting mugged on the side of the road in the middle of nowhere or in an alley in the city, uh, they don't have backup. They don't have somebody potentially coming. Nobody is there to render aid other than themselves. So there is actually a medical portion in the full class as well, just in case you have to make a shot or, or you shoot the other person and they surrender and then you can apply a tourniquet and stop the bleed really quickly. But to answer the, the question, the, the material is generally the same. There are twists and turns for law enforcement on the more control and capture side versus complete self-defense for the everyday person. Hey, Roll, I, since this is a gear review or a class review, I wanted to get the girls' take on how they liked the class. So, Haley, what did you think of the class? What did you learn? Um, so, learned about this class through Ashley. She promoted the heck out of it on social media. And I thought it looked really badass, but I've never done any outside training besides what my department issues... So I didn't really know what to expect other than getting beat up a little bit. And once we got into <laughs> it, um, I think I impressed myself a little bit with a lot that I've already knew how to do. I recently started jujitsu, and I saw how important that was in the grappling aspect of that class. Um, and I think it was just a really big reality check and very humbling and how, you know, when something goes really bad, I'm fortunate that I, I wasn't in anything like what we learned before this class because I'm not sure if I would have reacted in effective ways the way that I know know how to. Um, and I think being around, I think there's three other girls in the class. I think that was also really empowering and the support and all of that. It was um, it was honestly the most amazing class I've ever been to and I, it's going to be hard to compare anything I go to after that. So uh, I think that's, that's <laughs> a two thumbs up there, Roll. Oh yeah. So, um, Sounds Smashley, like it. Smashley, what did you think? So that was actually my second time attending uh, the close contact gunfighter class. And uh, and I've told Raul this, and I've told a bunch of my coworkers this, but I've been a cop for over 10 years, and that was by far the the best training I've ever received. Um, This is the training that law enforcement needs and we're not getting. Um, You know, as a cop, I've been in situations, unfortunately, where, you know, someone was trying to take my life, and... You could be a SWAT or some badass canine and just, you know, think that you have everything covered and replay everything in your head, how you would react. But when it comes down to it, when bullets are flying, you know, you're going to resort to your training. So, I mean, I I support this class and I, you know, I'm advertising the hell out of it because I want to see my brothers and sisters get home safe. All right. Well, that's all the time we have. Thank you, Roll, for calling in. I really appreciate you calling in. And thank you for my guests. Haley and Ashley for coming in too. And happy birthday again, Ashley. Hey, Thank happy you. birthday. The law enforcement profession has been under attack like never before over the last two years. Ashley and Haley are officers here to talk about their experiences from the front lines here in San Diego. But first, we are so proud to partner with the National Concealed Carry Association as a 10 ring partner. NCCA exists to serve the Second Amendment community by providing a nationwide network of 2A advocates. They offer elite self-defense and concealed carry training from the nation's top instructors and provide rock-bottom prices on the best selection of gear and accessories. You can learn more about them at National Concealed Carry Association.com. All right, Wendy, do you want to take this one? Sure. All right, so we're going to chat a little bit with Ashley and Haley if they're done <laughs> They're done chewing on their, Donut chewing on their donuts here. Which looks delicious. I haven't dug into mine yet. So first of all, I want to thank you both for your service. Thank you. It is an honor to be here with you guys. So, so tell me a little bit about your backgrounds, Haley. You mentioned early earlier you've been you've been in for ten years. Nope, that was oh that was that was Ashley. Sorry. So Ashley, you've been in for ten years. Mm -hmm. Haley, what about you? Four. Okay, awesome. 
So how did you guys, did you guys always know that you wanted to be a police officer? No, n- me no. Um, I'm Mexican and Filipino, so I was, I was expected to do real estate or <laughs> nursing, and I'm horrible at math, and I can't sit in an office. So um, for me, this was just kind of a series of life events mm-hmm. um, that kind of led me into people who are essentially our protectors, and that's pretty much how I got here. Very I'm cool. Very proud. What about you, Ashley? Um, I was always interested in law enforcement, you know, as a child, and but I think I was more interested in like the federal side of law enforcement. And then in college, I did a uh, a ride along uh, that a professor of mine uh, hooked up for me, and I was just like, wow, like this is awesome. I I want to do this. Do they? Do you guys do ride alongs? Because I would totally do that. We do, yeah. Um, COVID had restricted it for a while. I think we're starting to open up, so. I could find out for you, but yeah. it's coming up. Well, isn't if you go to the police department that you want to do the ride along, go to their website, and I'm sure there's yes probably mm-hmm. something on the site that says ride along, so that that you can you know apply and see if you'll be accepted. Yes, pretty much. Very cool. I will definitely check that out. So, you know, we've got two ladies here, which is very very cool, and um, you know we. You know, Melissa and I, as women in the gun industry, we experience a lot of different uh, reactions from people who don't expect us to be women in a male-dominated industry, and I'm sure you see that as well. So tell me about your experiences being women in law enforcement. Um, I mean, it's hard at times. Obviously, you're going to get some pushback. I mean, overall, I get support, I think, from family, coworkers, and the public, but, you know, you're always going to hit bumps in the road, and especially for me is I'm pretty small. I'm only 5'3", so I think that's a big reason why I always take my training so seriously because I know that I am at a size and strength disadvantage, so I want to make sure, like, you know, I'm always going to be able to protect myself and protect the community and my coworkers. Yeah, absolutely. Is law enforcement kind of like the military? Because, you know, like in the military, no matter what size you are, we've got your back. Do you find that in the police department, or do you catch a little bit of flack from the guys? Um, so I'll speak to my experience. I haven't had any negative experiences like that, and mm-hmm. um, that's not to say they don't exist. You know, there's other parts of the country where I'm sure oh, that's yeah. very true. Um, for me, I didn't grow up with a lot of strong men, or not strong men, just men in general in my family. And so when I started this profession, I was a little bit intimidated about being around men all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, And we're all type A personalities. (laughs) So I think my biggest concern was, you know, was my voice going to be heard? Was I going to be seen as an equal? And fortunately, I feel that 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 has been true for me. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think, though, that's not, I think the struggles of female officers throughout the history of this career... um, the things they went through is not in vain. It's because of what they went through that we get to enjoy that right. um, and be part of that big team. Same Very with, well said. Same with you, birthday yeah. girl. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I think overall I've had a really great experience, you know, my time as a cop, and um, I have a lot of respect from, from everyone I work with, and um, we all have each other's backs. And well, I'm sure it's how you present yourself, too. I mean, if you come across, like you said, serious about training, serious about your job, you know, it almost said the the, the fact that you're a female just kind of blends away. Well, I mean, you could say the same thing about male officers. Like, you know, you get male officers and it's like, you know, if they're, you know, if, if they're, if they're at, when the time comes and bullets are flying and if they're hiding, it doesn't matter if you're. Yeah. man or woman like yeah. it's it's about your mentality right and your heart so that brings me to a good segue so you mentioned off the air that you spend a significant amount of time training in both um you know hand-to-hand combat and uh with firearms and and you know you have to do all of that out of pocket and so tell me what's your perspective on that so Haley mentioned that your training department does a really good job providing a lot of well-rounded training um but is that enough or do you still find that you access to classes like field craft with Raul like those those just bring it to another level um I don't think there's ever going to be enough training I think um 
I am very fortunate that we have so much support with that internally. Um, but yeah, like Ashley has said, and a lot of us have said, um, there's just really never enough opportunity to keep going for it. And it's really your responsibility as an officer, not to just know the laws, not to just know what you can and can't do, but how you're going to get back home to your families and how you're going to get your partners there as well. Um, so the short answer, I can go on forever, is it's a great segue into pushing you to keep going. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, the law enforcement gets so much of a bad rap right now. And you'll hear people say, well, they just need to be better trained. Well, they just need to be. Okay. I don't think they've ever turned training down. You know, let's look at these different police departments, see how much training you're doing. Nobody talks about that. Nobody goes and says, well, XYZ police department does no training. I know that's not true, but they do no training. But yet station B does. I mean, I think, you know, and here again, you know, we're, I, the teachers union pops into my head. I think the police union should demand that each police department, I mean, you should all train identically. I don't think it should be one versus the other where one department gets more money. You know, we'll use La Jolla, for example. I know La Jolla doesn't have a police department, but, you know, they got more money than Alpine, you know. So I don't know why I never hear any voices speaking to that to try to get change. Does your unions get involved? I mean, do they try to go to the bat for you guys and girls? Or do we even want to talk about unions? Um, without getting any kind of politic, t- like politics involved in it, I would say that there is a lot of conversation going on and whether or not it's being broadcasted out to the public or not, I, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, I think as a general consensus for law enforcement, a lot of us are frustrated with not being able to get access to that type of training and funding. Um, but there's a lot of moving parts to it. And sure. I, I don't know what all the parts are. Yeah. I mean, without getting political, um, I know several departments off the top of my head that do no defensive tactics training. Like right. that, that's awful. Cause it's terrible. I mean, every week we go hands on with people, even if they're not resisting, we have to grab people to put them in handcuffs. Right. So like what we do the most, we train the least. And like, and one of my favorite quotes is like, I've never gone into a dangerous situation and thought I had too much training. You're, it's never enough. And, yeah. and we're not getting close to what, what we should be getting. It just And that's what makes my dad was a police officer for 36 years. So I get where you're coming from. And I just don't, I don't understand it. I hear all this rhetoric about the police department, but yet nobody's giving you the tools to do your job better. You know, it's just it's 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 mind boggling that that conversation, you know, has not has not come up. It's it's just it's just crazy. Well, I want to applaud both of you for going absolutely taking the initiative to to, to find that training and and go and you know go put yourself out there to take that extra step to be as well trained as possible. So, changing the topic a little bit, how how have you guys seen um, a change in? your your jobs um over the last year and a half since since covid like have you felt like it's <laughs> has it gotten worse um i know enforcement's been different as well so um what what changes have you seen um i think it's it's hard to pinpoint um what those changes are because there's there's way too many and they touch so many different things so um, I think just with the pandemic, that was a huge issue on its own. And that affected us with our staffing, with us being concerned about essentially being the only people in our counties on top of other essential workers. Um, you know, we don't want to get sick because if we get sick, who's, who's going to be out there to help? Right. Um, so that was just one thing. And then, you know, everything with the politics and, uh, all of that, you know, that was another concern is we love our jobs. We love taking care of people. We love what we do. And having that challenged very, very um, exclusively for as long as it was and still is, um, I can't think of anyone I work with or know that's in law enforcement that doesn't worry about that at the very forefront. Um, and then on that on top of that, you know, during the pandemic, a lot of people, the people that we serve in our communities – have their own struggles and a a lot of trauma has been instilled in a lot of them. So there are a lot of them resorted to alcohol, drugs and our calls for service with psychiatric responses or 
you know, combining that with drugs and alcohol, um, things have gotten a lot more violent. Yeah. And that kind of ties into a lot of the training that we're doing because it's not slowing down. Wow. Interesting. Crazy. So how can we as non-law enforcement help support you guys? <laughs> Cookies at the <laughs> police station? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's when when someone says hi to us and says thank you for your service sometimes I find myself not knowing the right response to say because we don't hear it a lot and I don't think we should demand that from people but that little moment of gratitude and acknowledgement goes a really long way um and you know that's just a place you could start and I think um it was mentioned in one of the earlier sections about being a good witness you know just being really aware of how to help us, the best thing you could do. Also, awesome. stay in the car and be respectful. Yes. <laughs> I think that's number one, if you want my well, opinion. you know, we live in a state where your self-defense rights are under attack. Let us be your voice to help defend and restore the Second Amendment. Help spread the word about the fight. There's two easy things that you can do. Like and subscribe to the show on YouTube, Facebook, Spotify, Instagram, or any podcast that you listen to. You can also share the show with as many friends as you can. And thanks for tuning in. And remember, together we will win. Well, this happens to be one of our favorite, favorite subjects. We've got uh, Sam, the gunman, on the line. And by the way, Sam, I just got to ask a quick question. When you were at uh, Oshkosh, did you happen to see Ford's Mach-E that auctioned off on Thursday and it re- and it was to uh, honor the the women in the Air Force, the WASPs. Did you happen to see that car? Um, no, I'm afraid I did not. Oh. I was paying more attention to um, the aircraft okay. stuff. All right. Wendy, you going to do the question? I am. Hey, Sam, how are you? Pretty good. How are you? Good. All right. So we've got a question from Mark from Laguna Beach. What was the first rifle to bear the Winchester name? Mark from Laguna Beach. Thanks for the question. Um, this, I, I, I said, let me just stop right here and say I think the listeners to the show have figured out what my weak areas are, and now they're just driving in on that. And, and among those is like early to mid nineteenth century um, black powder stuff. Now I, I'm not I'm not too terribly well versed on the the history of Winchester as a company. Um, I know one of their earliest commercially successful models was the, um, I think it was the model 1860, right? But I don't, I don't know if that was their first rifle. All right. So the correct answer is the model 1866 yellow boy became the very first rifle to bear the Winchester name. The brass frame gave that 1866 an iconic look and an iconic nickname that are well recognized to this day. It's the predecessor of the legendary 1873 that won the West. So yeah, there you have it. I, I yeah, um, I'm yeah. That that's that's a tough <laughs> question. Um, great question. Um, I I know I was sort of close, but the the 66 and the 73 especially um, were. Uh, very, very popular models that pretty much kick-started Winchester as a company. And it certainly helped that later on in like the 1890s, they got John Browning on their team um, designing stuff for them, including the, uh, I believe the Model 94 and Model 95 were his inventions as well. Hey, Sam, since we're in your weak area here, uh, uh-huh. question, when I saw, I was reading the answer here and it said the yellow boy is do you know, is there not a Henry rifle that was called that or something similar to that that was really popular back then? I don't, uh, I, I think there's a Henry, there was a Henry Yellow Boy. I know in uh, in current production, in Henry's product lineup, they have the Golden Boy, um, which is a series of uh, lever action rifles with brass receivers. Um, very, very easy to get fingerprints on. You have to handle them with extreme delicacy, but uh Henry really does a great job with with their lever action rifles. Unlike Winchester, um, they've really leaned hard into that product line, and that's their specialty. That's pretty much all they do, and they're they're really beautiful. Yeah, I think maybe that's what I'm thinking of the Golden Boy, because I, I know what the uh, I've got a a, um, a Winchester 1873 replica gun, which I love, 
But the um, the Henry's got the open magazine on it too, which I thought was uh, I don't know how problematic that is or not with the slide that's on it, but um, but cool yeah, rifle. it's um, they they say it was a problem uh, for inexperienced users. You had to um, move your hand when the magazine follow. For, for those of you who don't know, the magazine follower in the magazine tube on some of those early Henry models. Um, slides back and has a portion that's exposed externally. So if you have your hand in the wrong place, then as it's feeding, you can actually stop up the magazine. And so you have to move your hand to keep that from happening. All right, buddy. Well, hey, that was awesome. Uh, glad you enjoyed Oshkosh, and we will talk to you next Sunday. Thanks very much for having me on. Like I said, uh, great question, really hard question. Yeah, I think you're right. I think people are starting to figure out where your weak <laughs> spot is. All right, take care. All right, Wendy, you're going to do the... <laughs> the mic drop. It's going to be Wendy drop. Mic drop. With Wendy. <laughs> All right. This week's Wendy drop is a little bit more of a cautionary tale, and I am going to be teaching a lesson today. So we're going to be focusing on San Diego City Council's Marnie Von Wilbert. She was elected just a year ago in 2020. So in this case, foresight was 2020, not hindsight. Ha ha. San Diego County gun owners, we actually endorsed her opponent and we went into the November election afraid that the election was going to be tough. This district was totally winnable and the seat was originally held by SCCGO endorsed council member who had termed out. And registration wasn't horribly lopsided against us. But unfortunately, our endorsed candidate lost, and Marnie became one of the new city council members in San Diego. So, lesson number one, elections have consequences. Marnie came from the San Diego City Attorney's Office, and if you've been listening to Gun Owners Radio, or following San Diego County Gun Owners, or even just reading the Union Tribune, you already know that San Diego City Attorney's Office is very horribly anti-gun. From their abuse of red flag laws to their frequent partnering with anti-gun groups, there is little debate. The city attorney in San Diego and her office are no friend to gun owners. It comes as no surprise that just months into her term, Marnie is already authoring an anti-gun regulation. So lesson number two, candidates are important, and if you listen to them, they will tell you who they are. Last week, Marnie announced a new silly scheme. She wants to outlaw raw materials like metal and plastic, or at least try to regulate metal and plastic as if metal and plastic are a gun. The latest gun boogeyman that the anti-gun folks are using to demonize and villainize gun owners like you is ghost guns. Marnie's idea is to make people put serial numbers on hunks of metal and hunks of plastic that they have purchased before it is actually a firearm. The stated purpose is to keep 80% kits out of the hands of career criminals, but the result will be that honest gun owners who are trying to comply with the law while making their gun will be caught in yet another California gun law bear trap. Lesson number three, what they say and what, what they say they are doing and what they are doing are frequently two different things. The reality is this new law that will be discussed tomorrow at San Diego City Council meeting does little more than harass gun owners. Gun owners who want to do the right thing, gun owners who want to be honest and follow the laws. The city of San Diego is changing the procedure for building a gun so that it is different than it currently is in 49 other states and different from the other 57 counties in California and different from the other 17 cities in San Diego County. So to what end? They want to make sure that the two or three shops in San Diego who sell 80% kits in the city of San Diego can't. And that the people who try to build guns for lawful purposes fail. But the real purpose, it's just a PR move. How do I know that? Because we reached out to Marnie's office and spoke to the person who will really write the regulation. And he all but admitted that they know it won't actually stop crime, but it will give them the opportunity to get the word out and influence the law in other cities, counties, and states. Hmm. So what's probably going to happen? Well, in about five minutes after the city passes this ban on 80% kits, a 79% kit will appear in the marketplace. 
So lesson number four, we will always find a way. (laughs) My final lesson, lesson number five, if we don't start here and we don't start now, and if we don't write, if we don't win right here in our own backyard, people like San Diego City Council member Marnie Von Wilpert will continue to win and continue to pass laws that restrict and harass us, the sane, trained, law-abiding gun owner. I will be a part of the city council meeting tomorrow at 11 a.m., and I will be making the case that this law hurts rather than helps the honest and the compliant. So watch San Diego County gun owners' emails and social media to see my statement. And in the meantime, join us, and let's teach them all a lesson in losing. And that is... Mic drop. You got to give me the cue. Yeah. yeah. Aren't you listening? Yeah, I'm waiting for You're the cue. Mike says only on do it when I do the cue and all chair. that stuff. Oh, my gosh. That's Brandon, folks. And all complaints go to 1-800. Brandon, all Brandon. All right. Hey, this is... Hey, by the way, if you're listening on YouTube or the podcast, hit that like and subscribe button and share the show with as many friends as you can. And leave a comment if you'd like. It helps us get around those uh, algorithms and please support our great sponsors. San Diego County Gun Owners, $10 a month. Do it. U.S. Law Shield, almost the same. Dillon Law Group, <laughs> PRMI Mortgage, Black Hound Optics, and National Concealed Carry Association. Hey, and I really, really want to thank Wendy, Melissa, uh, the birthday girl, and then that other girl. I can't remember your name. Haley. Haley. And what's the birthday girl's name? Smashley. She's a Leo, too. That's why I like her. <laughs> Thanks. And then, by the way, Joe Jermisi, Mr. Blog. Okay. Well, at least it wasn't Ulysses. So, uh, nah, no, I gave it up. I decided not to call you Ulysses this time. <laughs> And, of course, uh, the rest of our crew. And then, you know, Mr. Talkative been there, uh, Brendan Thomas, the donut guy. And, again, go to gunownersradio.com for podcasts, latest information. And please stop by any of our sponsors and thank them. And, hey, Bob Siegel's coming up. I see smoke coming out of the other room. So it ought to be a pretty awesome show. All right, guys and girls, be safe. Keep our Second Amendment rights alive and well. And next time you see a police officer... Give him a hug. Right here on FM 961, AM 1170. The answer.